Welcome to the video on how to write your lab report for experiment 7, energy accompanying reactions. In part A of the experiment, the percentage of water in a hydrate will be determined. In part B of the experiment, more salts will be dissolved in water and classified as to whether they are exothermic or endothermic chemical reactions. To determine the percentage of water in a hydrate, a similar procedure to that which was used to determine the percentage of oxygen in the percent composition lab will be used. It may be useful to review the decomposition of potassium chlorate video. One difference between the two labs is that in this lab, a Bunsen burner is used instead of a Fischer burner. The Bunsen burner produces a lower temperature flame. This should minimize the decomposition of the anhydrous copper 2 sulfate into copper 2 sulfide. In an endothermic reaction, the products have higher energy than the reactants. Therefore, energy, usually in the form of heat, flows into the reacting system. Since energy is needed to make the reaction proceed, heat can be written as a reactant in the chemical reaction. Since energy is flowing from the surroundings into the reaction system, the surroundings are losing energy. Therefore, the surroundings will get colder and a decrease in temperature will be observed. In an exothermic reaction, the products have lower energy than the reactants. Therefore, energy, usually in the form of heat, flows out of the reacting system. Since energy is released as the reaction proceeds, heat can be written as a product in the chemical reaction. Since energy is flowing into the surroundings, the surroundings are gaining energy. Therefore, the surroundings will get hotter and an increase in temperature will be observed. Let's go through the data and calculations for part A, removing water from copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. Line 1 shows that the mass of the empty crucible used is 18.3005 grams. A certain amount of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is used in the reaction. Line 2 shows that the combined mass of the crucible and copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is 22.3740 grams. The copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate starts out as blue crystals. Upon heating, the blue color fades. After the first heating, a residue remains in the crucible. The residue is a gray powder. Line 3 shows that the mass of the crucible and residue after the first heating is 20.9021 grams. To ensure that all the water has been removed from the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, a second heating is carried out. Line 4 shows that the mass of the crucible and residue after the reheating is 20.8993 grams. Note that there is a slight difference in mass after the first and second heating. The difference is measurable and observed in the third decimal place. As a result, the mass of the second heating is used in the calculation of the mass of the residue which remains. To calculate the mass of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate used, line 1 is subtracted from line 2. Line 5 shows that the mass of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate used in the reaction is 4.0735 grams. To calculate the mass of the anhydrous copper 2 sulfate, which is the residue, line 1 is subtracted from line 4. Line 6 shows that the mass of the anhydrous copper 2 sulfate is 2.5988 grams. The difference in mass between line 5, the mass of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, and line 6, the mass of the anhydrous copper 2 sulfate after the heatings, must be the mass of water that was released as a gas. Line 7 shows that the mass of water released is 1.4747 grams. Let's use these raw data to calculate the experimental determination of the percentage of water in copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. The percentage of water in copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is equal to the mass of water divided by the mass of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate multiplied by 100%. Look up the mass of water in the data table. It is line 7, 1.4747 grams. Look up the mass of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in the data table. It is item 5, 4.0735 grams. Do the calculation and be sure to apply the significant figures rules for division and rounding to arrive at the answer. The answer is 36.202%. It has five significant figures. It may be helpful to review the video on significant figures, multiplication and division rule, and the video. The theoretical percentage of water in copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate can be determined by calculating the mass of water in a given mass of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. A convenient sample size to consider is 1 mole of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. In 1 mole of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, there are 5 moles of water. 
So the mass of water in one mole of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is five times the molar mass of water. The formula for the percentage of water is equal to five times the molar mass of water divided by the molar mass of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate multiplied by 100%. The theoretical percentage of water should have as many significant figures as the experimental value. To do this, make sure you use enough significant figures in your atomic masses. It may be useful to review the video on significant figures, multiplication and division rule. The percent error calculation can be carried out using this formula as shown. For the theoretical percentage of water, copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, please consult slide 7. For the experimental percentage of water, copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, please consult slide 6. Show your work in the space provided and report your answer with a proper number of significant figures. It may be useful to review the video on how to write experiment 3, weighing and density measurements, for a sample calculation of percent error. In part B of the experiment, the temperature change associated with substances dissolving in water will be observed and the process will be classified as being either endothermic or exothermic. Remember to record the temperatures to the correct number of significant figures. It may be useful to review the video, How to Write Experiment 5, Introduction to Separation Techniques 2, for how to describe the appearance of a substance. When the solid dissolves, if an increase in temperature is observed, then the dissolution process has released heat. In this case, the reaction is exothermic and heat is written as a product of the chemical reaction. When the solid dissolves, if a decrease in temperature is observed, then the dissolution process has absorbed heat. In this case, the reaction is endothermic and heat is written as a reactant in the chemical reaction. Using a clean and dry test tube, the test tube is filled to about 2 cm in depth. Record the appearance of the solid. Insert a thermometer into the solid and record the solid's temperature. In this case, the temperature is about 28 degrees Celsius. Add about 5 milliliters of water into the test tube and mix. Record the maximum or minimum temperature the solution reaches. In this case, the minimum temperature is about 10 degrees Celsius. Record the appearance of the solution. Heat can be included in the chemical reaction as a reactant. The dissolution reaction would be solid ammonium chloride plus heat, giving aqueous ammonium chloride. Using a clean and dry test tube, Repeat this process for all the samples. To prevent contamination of the samples, clean and dry the thermometer between each sample. In this case, the temperature increased to about 53 degrees Celsius. This is an example of a reaction that released heat and would be an exothermic reaction. For an exothermic reaction, heat would be included as a product in the chemical reaction. It may be useful to review the video on endothermic exothermic temperature change. The first lab question involves writing the chemical reaction which occurred in part A and B of this lab. When writing the reactions, make sure they are balanced, pay attention to the subscripts, superscripts, and include the physical states of all the substances. Also, include heat in the chemical reaction. If the reaction is endothermic, then heat will be written on the reactant side, whereas if the reaction is exothermic, then heat will be written on the product side of the reaction. The second lab question asks to calculate the theoretical percentage of water in sodium dichromate dihydrate. Consult slide 7 to see how this is done. Note that the number of moles of hydrate is different in this case. Consult the conclusion writing guide in the lab manual for what should be included in the conclusion. The conclusion should include the definition of a hydrate, Bunsen burner, endothermic and exothermic reactions, and how these are related to this lab. Include heat and physical states in the reactions for part A. To display observation and classification of reactions in part B, a table may be a useful way to summarize the results. When reporting the experimental and theoretical percentage of water and the percent error in part A, make sure that the numbers are reported to the correct number of significant figures. This is the end of the video on how to write your lab report for experiment 7, energy accompanying reactions.